want to find me on Twitter or Facebook, I'm at Active Bob. Let's talk about blogs rank on the first page. And when we talk about search engine SEO, search engine optimization, I'm going to focus our discussion today on Google. And the reason I do that is Google is sending, you know, it's eroding a little bit, but they're sending 60 to 65% of the traffic out to the greater internet. If you do the right things for Google, we tend to see that that your content will also rank in in you know the Bing's and the Yahoo's and I think Yahoo's actually powered by Bing now but I'm gonna use Google kinda of synonymous for search engines another thing that I like to kinda of throw the caveat in right here is I do not consider myself a search engine expert okay and I I know you're in an SEO class and you're and you're looking to I guess learn from an expert the, Google doesn't send emails out to, to people can calling themselves search engine experts and say, hey, here's the changes we made. Here's exactly what you need to do. This is based on 10 years that we've been in the real estate space, uh, generating leads, getting, getting pages and sites to rank well. So this is based on our experience. I believe that anybody that says, you know, I'm an SEO expert and you should do exactly what I say, um, gosh, they're probably a little bit full of themselves. But... They're, they're, and they're probably doing that based on their experience. So I'm going to share with you some of the experiences that we've had in real estate and, and kind of the collective experience of, you know, a couple of thousand active RAIN members that have been doing this um, with, with some success. So let's look at kind of the foundation of search engine optimization. And this guy here at the bottom, I don't know if you can see at the very bottom here, this pyramid was created by Rand Fishkin at SEO Moz. And SEO Moz is these guys are search engine experts and Rand Fishkin is one of the kind of foremost search engine experts out there he would be one of the few people that I would look at and say yeah that guy's a search engine expert Th this kind of foundation of SEO where that the base of the pyramid is content quality and accessibility that's really what we are going to be talking about today is how do I fashion my content in a way that makes it you know appear to be quality content to the search engines but also accessible and now I say appear to be quality content the search engines are getting really good at understanding what is and what is not quality content right they're looking at things like sentence structure and and semantic phrases and how the words on the page relate to one another and so it's it's getting a lot harder to trick them these days so we really want to understand that at the at the foundation of good good SEO is going to be quality content and accessibility. The next level then is keyword research and targeting. And so am I am I writing about something that somebody is going to be looking for or or am I thinking in terms of how people go online to search? And we'll talk a little bit about that link building. We have next week at Active Rain University we'll do a you know this same same bat time, same bat channel. We will do a whole hour on link building. So we'll really cover that component of SEO next week and then social is kind of this new emerging thing where they're starting to 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 look at different signals and and you know did your is your content getting shared on places like Facebook or Twitter so we're not going to dive too much into social today other than you do have the ability to share your content directly out of active rain if you're a rainmaker so again we're really going to focus down there kind of in the bottom of this pyramid today one of the concepts that I mean, this is probably a, the most important concept out of today is the concept of the long tail. And if you guys were sitting in front of me, you know, there's 250 of you on the call here. If you guys were in a room in front of me, I'd say, how many of you guys have heard of the long tail? And I would imagine, a, you know, probably half of you would raise your hand and say, yeah, I've heard of the long tail. Why don't you guys, in the questions area, just to give me a little sense, why don't you guys go in there and tell me how many of you guys have heard of the long tail? All right, so we're getting, uh, they're coming in pretty quick, but, you know, there's definitely some folks that haven't. Let me, let me explain it just in what I think is the most easy way to understand it. The way that Amazon sells books is on the long tail, and when Amazon set out to, to, to become basically the number one bookseller in the world, they realized that the way people shopped for books to that point was they would walk into their local Barnes & Noble or Border Books, and they would buy their books there. And... What, what happens is in the book industry, in, in any given year, you have about 100 books that make up about 30% of the sales. Those are the top selling books, okay? The Harry Potters, the, the John Grisham novels, and I may be dating myself a little bit as far as when I was a big reader, but, you know, Dan Brown, with these guys that where their books come out, they sell 500,000 copies or 3 million copies, and those 100 books make up 
30% of the sales. But what Amazon realized is there is literally 99.99% of the other books that are available to buy make up 70% of the sales, but any one of those books doesn't sell very often. Okay, so you, you might have a book that sells 15 times a year or 30 times a year. And for Barnes & Noble, it, they cannot stock that book on their shelves, right? A book that sells 15 times a year in the whole country, th there's no way they can stock it on their shelves because their shelf space is, is, is valuable. Well, at Amazon, they don't have the concept of shelf space, right? They can stock every single book, and if it only sells 15 times, that's fine. They're going to be the place that sells it all 15 of those times. And the cumulative of all of those books that sell over the course of a year, but none of them sell very often, but the cumulative of that makes up 70% of the sales. And we have something similar in search. And what happens in search is you have these phrases that are called head terms. And they are the, the most common way that somebody would search for something in a given vertical. So we're looking at one that says shoes. So go online, say shoes, or new shoes, or buy shoes, or shoes, right? As you get more specific with the phrase that somebody's searching for, there is, that phrase is searched for less often, but there's an infinite number of, of ways that you can manipulate that phrase. So as we get out here on the long tail for shoes, we see red Nike men's running shoes, right? That could just easily be blue Adidas women's running shoes. And it could be, you know, 10,000 different variations of that, where any one of those isn't searched for very often, but the cumulative of them is searched for more often than the common phrases. Now in real estate, your head terms are going to be things like Seattle real estate, homes for sale in Seattle, Seattle condos, Seattle houses for sale. There's about eight terms in any one of your markets that make up those head phrases. As you get out on the long tail, there are literally thousands and thousands and thousands of ways, and I'm going to show you guys some of those ways when we go and look at Google Analytics, th that people will search for real estate. So instead of just searching for a Seattle condo, which gets searched for much more often, somebody might be searching for a loft condo in Belltown, Seattle, and Belltown is a, na a specific neighborhood of Seattle. Now that search is not going to get done as often, right? But it's going to get us somebody that's a heck of a lot closer to actually buying something, and we're going to be able to rank for it. Most of us on the call today aren't going to just set out tomorrow and be able to rank for you know, condos in our city or real estate in Seattle or Seattle real estate. But we can take a look at this long tail, and that's really where we can find people that are closer to actually buying something, and we can get up there and rank. And so we'll, we'll kind of flush this concept out as we go through here. So let's talk about how do we get found on page one of Google. I'm going to give you four kind of tenets, things that as you set out to write blog posts that rank well in the search engines, every single time you write a post, you are going to be considering these four things. There's going to be some other things at the end that we're also going to consider, but these are kind of the, the foundation to begin with. Okay, So we're going to write posts that are 200 to 500 words. We're going to pick a keyword phrase for the title of our blog post. We're going to repeat that title at the start and the end of our content, and then we're going to use our keyword phrase, that keyword phrase that we pick three to five times. Now, I'm going to go through the two, three, and four individually. Let's just look at number one for a second, 200 to 500 words. Okay, the, Google will index content under 200 words, okay? It, it seems that they will not index content where there's less than 100 words on a page because what is Google's optimal goal? Their goal is to get their customer, the person searching, <clears throat> the most relevant results, but also a result that has value. Now, it's almost impossible, and I would actually challenge you to prove me wrong, to, to demonstrate that you're an expert on any subject in under 100 words. Okay, and what we're doing here, not only for the search engines, but more importantly for the people that will actually find our content, we're demonstrating to them that we're an expert on whatever the heck they just searched for. So in 200 words, it's still a little bit challenging to prove I'm an expert on loft condos in Belltown, Seattle in 200 words, right? But, but I'm getting a little bit closer, and as I start to get up to 500 words, right, I can probably put together a pretty good piece of content that, that would prove to not only the search engine, but to the person that lands there that I know what the heck I'm talking about if they want to buy a loft condo in Belltown. Okay, so 200 to 500 words. Let's, let's look at picking a keyword phrase for our title, and this may be the most important because it really sets up 
and it sets the scene for what is it that the person's going to be searching for and, and finding us based on. Okay, so when we're picking a keyword phrase for our title, we want to consider a few things, okay? Any one blog post or page on the internet is, is going after one keyword phrase. We're trying to rank for one phrase. So we're not going to, you know, we would never write a post about loft condos in Belltown, Queen Anne, Fremont, right? We wouldn't try to stuff a bunch of different keyword phrases into one blog post or, or the title of one of our blog posts. So just one keyword phrase per blog post or page. Now, we may consider different variations for subsequent posts. So if today I wrote about loft condos in Belltown, Seattle, <clears throat> and six months from now I wanted to, to kind of shake it up, well, I might write about, you know, Belltown, Seattle condos or Belltown, Seattle loft condos. Just that slight variation of the keyword phrase and the way that somebody could search for it could change my results, right? My, my post about loft condos in Belltown, Seattle, if somebody searched for it the other way, Belltown, Seattle loft condos, right, the inverse, it would show in a different position. So with subsequent posts that I've written, I may consider kind of varying the order of my keywords. I'm almost always going to use geography, and I realize kind of the folly of having almost and always right next to each other, especially when I have always in bold. But your posts aren't always going to be geared towards a consumer. So if you're, if you're gearing your posts towards your peers, right, you're trying to get some advice from, you don't need to add geography in there. Okay? If you're writing a post that's real specific that you're going to like send to a client, you don't necessarily need to get that geographical component in there. But most of the time, if you're setting out to just write a piece of content that you hope people are going to find, especially people in your market, it makes sense to have geography because it would be pretty cool if you ranked for, you know, get my home ready to sell. If somebody went online and typed in, get my home ready to sell, right, that'd be awesome if you ranked right on the first page for that. But if the person was in Seattle doing that search and you're an agent in Dallas, it's probably not as important to you as somebody who was in Dallas. And so what will happen is almost all search, number four right there, is made up of subject plus geography, okay? There's always some subject matter in our search. And in real estate, that subject matter is, you know, the word real estate or homes for sale or condos for sale or houses for sale, right? That's the subject matter. But the geography becomes kind of the indicator of where exactly are they looking for that information about. So they're looking for condos for sale in Belltown, Seattle, right? Some, some component of geography and subject. And I would encourage you to really think about that because I see a lot of posts where the person that wrote it, that's a pretty good post, but they did not indicate, you know, the geographical component. And the search engines are getting really good. Like if somebody did do a search of getting my home ready to sell, Google's going to look at where are they searching from? They're going to look at their IP address to see where they're searching from. They're going to try to get them content that's relative to them geographically. So we really want to be thinking about our keyword phrase in terms of having a geography of some sort in it. So geography plus subject, I talked about that. Let's, let's look at this a little bit more closely because as we start to think about the long tail or as we're really kind of applying that concept, for our keyword phrase, the more precise our geography is, the less precise our subject can be. And the flip side of that is the more precise our subject matter is, the less precise our geography can be. No, uh huh? Like, what? Let's look at a more specific subject matter with a less specific geography. So in this case, I'm just using Seattle as my geography, right? Now, again, it's not going to, unfortunately, I wish this wasn't the case, but I'm not just going to be able to write about homes for sale in Seattle tomorrow on my blog and get it on the first page of the search engine. Why? Well, because we have these big box places like the Barnes and Nobles, right? The, the Trulias, the Zillows, the Realtor.coms, Realestate.coms, the Homes.com, right? These big box that have millions and millions of pages. They're all across the country. And the search engines identify with them as kind of the experts in homes for sale in Seattle, right? Very... Um, less specific geography, less specific subject matter. But if we get more specific with our subject matter, and I give you some examples here, and there's you know a hundred different ways that somebody could search more homes in Seattle under 400,000, under 450, under 250, under 150, right? So 
adding components of price in there. Homes for sale in Seattle with a mother-in-law suite or with a four-car garage or with a master bedroom on the main floor or, right, there's all these components of features in a home that can make our subject matter more specific. So our subject matter in that case is homes for sale with a mother-in-law suite, right? Homes for sale in Redmond near Microsoft. I, we see this kind of search a lot where people are using near or close to as kind of a, a, an enhancement for their search, right? So if you have big companies around you where somebody might be relocating in and looking for a job that's near, like in here, we've got Microsoft and Expedia and Boeing, and right? Hopefully you have some similar sorts of things. The other one is school districts, right? Homes for sale in Seattle, the Lake Washington School District. Homes for sale in Bellevue near Bellevue High School, <clears throat> right? These are more specific subject matter where our geography is, is pretty, pretty basic. It's a city level. Or we can get more specific with our geography. So the Bravern condos for sale in Seattle, right? Where our geography is the Bravern condos in Seattle. It's a very specific building. Or homes for sale in Hunters Ridge, Celine, where Hunters Ridge is a subdivision of Celine. These very specific geographies, right? Homes for sale in Seattle, 98109. That's my least favorite, but I, we see people doing it and we see searches coming in where people are looking at specific zip codes. And in some of your markets, that would apply more than in others. Okay, so that concept of the more precise our geography, the less precise we can be with our subject matter as we're deciding what the title of our blog post is going to be. Or the more precise our geography, the, the subject, the less precise we can be with our geography. I hope that makes sense. I tried to drive that home a little bit more than I've done in past classes. Okay, <clears throat> so the second thing after we've picked the keyword phrase for the title is we're going to repeat that title at the start and at the end of our post. And you, you guys know what this is on my screen. It's a Google result and we've all seen what a Google result looks like. The portion in the blue up at the top, that's going to come from the page title of the page. And the page title on an active rain post for our rainmakers is based on the keyword, or the phrase you use in the title of your blog. So in the second example there, the active rain example, the title of his blog post is Riverwatch Condos, Burlington, Vermont. Okay? Now we're going to repeat that title at the start in the end of our post. And the reason we do that is because, as you can see in the black there, that's the page description. So that's kind of the second thing the search engine's looking at. The first thing is the title. What is this page about based on they've told me there's a title? The second thing is what's the description of this page? So we have you get your, your, your keyword phrase you use in your title into that first 140 characters. That's about what you're seeing in the black there is 140 characters. That's the page description. Now I have you put it at the end of the post, and when we put it in here, we're going to do it exactly as it was in the title, okay? We're going to use our keyword phrase three to five times. Now we, we got it in there once in the first 140 characters, and I suggested you get it in there again at the end of the post, and one of the reasons I do this is because it's a really easy place to get your keyword phrase in there again. But I also do it because I had a, I was a horrible English student until about the seventh or eighth grade, the eighth grade I think. And I'm an English teacher that as we learned to write five paragraph essays, you guys have, if, if you were a decent student, you probably remember this, right? First paragraph, what do you do? You tell them what you're going to tell them about. The next three paragraphs, what do you do? You tell them about it. And then in the fifth paragraph, you tell them what you just told them about, right? That's the concept here. We're going to have the title at the start telling them what we're about to tell them about, and we're going to we're going to get the, the body of the content there. And then at the end, we're going to tell them what we just told them about by using our keyword phrase again. Okay. As we've got our keyword phrase into the body of the post three to five times, now if we used it once in the beginning and once at the end, we've, we've only got to get it in there one to three more times, right? These are a little bit out of order here. It's actually really, really important that your use of the keyword phrase in the body of your post is exactly as it is in the page title, those three to five times, okay? So in his case, Riverwatch Condos, Burlington, Vermont, he would want to get that phrase, just as it is there, Riverwatch Condos, Burlington, Vermont, into the body of his post 
three to five times. Now you want to make sure at the end of the day, when you're all done writing, that that phrase was the most common phrase on the page. And if you use it five times, there's a pretty good chance that that will end, have ended up being the most common phrase. Okay, but just check it, make sure. What some of our members will do is they will use bold on the keyword phrase, so it's real easy for them to see, yep, got it in there four times, right? And then does the body have similar content? And when we're talking about a blog post, it's almost impossible to write something where the rest of the content on the page doesn't end up matching or being similar to the keyword phrase. Because if we were writing about loft condos in Belltown, Seattle, what kinds of things would you expect to find on the page in addition to that? You'd expect to find things about maybe the homeowners association or the, the parking or the, the amenities, the kitchen, the bathroom, right? All these words that a search engine understands relate to loft condos in Belltown, Seattle. Okay, again, that part's almost impossible to mess up, especially if you're actually writing something with sentences and paragraphs. Okay, so let's go look at some of those four things kind of in action. And what we're going to do here is we're going to come out of the, the slideshow for a minute, and we're going to look at some organic searches that are being done that are leading people to active rain and when I pull up my search or, or my Google Analytics and we're looking at the back end of active rains Google Analytics here I'm going to actually perform the searches in Safari and the reason I do that is because when you use your browser Google starts to get very familiar with you. And so on my Firefox browser, I'm logged into Google, right? I'm logged into my Google account. So they know any time I've ever been logged into my Google account and done a search, they know my behavior. They know what websites I clicked on, and they start to craft their results to me personally. They, I never clear my cache or my cookies. They're looking at all these things on my browser to try to determine what's the best result for me. So. I don't really want to know what the best result for me is. I kind of want to know what the best result is for somebody that's not me, somebody that's just out there that's not searching real estate all the time, that's not on active rain all the time, that's not on my own website all the time. So in Safari, I always keep a clean browser, and I get a clean Safari browser by coming over here and hitting res Reset Safari. Right? I'm not going to do that right now because I did it right before I set this up, but I also keep my Safari and private browsing. I'm trying to keep that search engine away from knowing who I am so they don't distort my results as I come in here and start doing some searches to show you guys some of the, the live stuff that's happening here. So what I have right here is the queries on homes for sale on, in the last 30 days. So we're looking at a 30-day set of queries that have landed somebody on active rain okay and we've got 24,000 almost 25,000 different ways where somebody's used the phrase homes for sale in their search query and we'll see there's all kinds of of different phrases in here I'm gonna find this one because it's what we're using as an example so Secord Lakes homes for sale Secord Lake homes for sale so what we have here is a pretty specific geography this is not the city it's a it's a lake right it's it's very specific geographical component of somebody's market. Now the, the subject matter is pretty pretty vague or, or less specific because we've got this real specific geographic indicator. And I bet if we were to go here, so here's homes for sale on Secord Lake, right? Less surge traffic. This one's gotten 15, 15 visitors of which 60% of those visitors were new. So if my math was better, I think it'd be eight. Right, eight or nine of those nine maybe of those visitors were new visitors just in the last thirty days now. Okay, and they spent an average amount of time on the page of fifty-three seconds, and thirty-three percent of them bounced, which means sixty-six percent of them took some other action when they landed on that page. So let's go look at that search. Okay, so we've got Secord Lake Homes for sale. Okay, so what we see in here is the second result is going to be the active rain result. And notice that their, their title, Waterfront Homes for Sale on Secord Lake. 
So would it have behooved her maybe later, six months later, a year later, to come back and do another post that matched this keyword phrase, right? See the difference in the order there? She may have jumped up over this point two website, but that's okay. She's in the second position right now. Here's the post itself. So we've got waterfront homes for sale on Secord Lake. We see that she uses her keyword phrase in here, right, to start the post off. So she's got it in there, which we know if we're looking at that result there because we see waterfront homes for sale on Secord Lake in the description, which they're pulling out of the top of this post. Okay. And then she goes down in here and, and starts to kind of give us the content, right? Secord Lake is approximately 2,000 acres and there's lots of fun stuff to do there. And uh, people ride their boats and the jet skis and, and she's just writing a piece of content because she knows about Secord Lake. She sells homes there. She's very familiar with the area. Okay. I don't know what this is. Maybe it's 200 words, right? Would this prove to you that she's an expert? Maybe, maybe not. Is there something to be desired in the, the actual visual appearance of this content, I believe, and maybe had she taken our class last week where we talked about how to get our posts looking a little bit more professional, she could have gotten something more professional, but that's okay. People are still landing here, right? We see that not everybody's bouncing, right? So people are diving into this piece of content to some degree, okay? She's got one featured property in here, and then she's got this click here to search more available listings in Secord Lake. Now, she doesn't necessarily get her keyword phrase on here three to five times, right? Now, the fact that she's gotten, she's, she's writing on a long tail search term. It's not a search term that's searched for millions of times a, a month, right? She's still able to rank even though she's missed some of the things in here that maybe she could have taken advantage of to get this thing a little bit stronger. And that's all right. When was this post written? Let's go down here and look. This post was written in October of 2010, which means it's, 23 months old, okay? So let's go over here. We're in her traffic right now, and you guys could all get to your traffic. If you were on your My Home page, there's this little link over here that says traffic, and what this is showing us is the stats, the traffic stats on this particular post, and what you're really going to be paying attention to is the clicks. And the clicks is how many times this URL right here has been loaded up in somebody's browser. If it got loaded in their browser, right, there's a pretty good chance they saw this page. So 2,700 times in the last 23 months, so it's an average of about 110 times a month. I, you know, I used to be on the math team, and that would have been a ridiculously easy conversion for me to do. And Mr. Frio, my math teacher, would be really disappointed in me these days. But it's averaging about 110 clicks a month, right? Now, if she, now like even this one right here, Waterfront Homes for Sale in Sugar Springs, right? That one's, it's 500, which is what, a fifth of that? But that one's still getting 20 to 25 clicks a month, right? If she had done every single lake around her area in this fashion, right? The cumulative of that becomes very substantial over time because she's getting 20 clicks here and 35 clicks here. And on this one, the Secord Lake, she's getting 110 clicks. The cumulative of that can be can be very, very, um, you know, it could have a large impact on your business. But now, what was that search query? It was Secord Lake's home for sale. What I want to show you is there, and we saw that one, that one only got 15. So how is she averaging 110? Well, if we come over here and look at this next little kind of preloaded thing I have, and again, this is just for the last 30 days. Okay, I just pulled this up this morning. Now let's look at all of the different ways that somebody searched for Secord Lake and found that piece of content, right? Even though these things don't necessarily match exactly to her title, she's still gotten very specific with what she's targeting. So she has the ability to rank for all this different stuff. Look at this, homes for sale on Secord Lake, which is pretty similar. But as we start to get down here a little bit, Secord Lake waterfront property. Like I want that person. I want those three people that searched that in the last 30 days to be finding me and identifying me as the expert. Right? I mean, look at these. Secord Lake, Secord Lakefront homes for sale. Bank owned home, Secord Lake. Buying a second home on Secord Lake, right? These are people that are a heck of a lot closer to buying something than somebody that just searched for a home for sale in Gladwin. Cottages for sale, Secord Lake, right? 
foreclosed homes on Secord Lake. You just you see all these different ways that somebody searched for Secord Lake and found her content. These folks are are closer to buying something than the guy that just searched homes for sale in where was this at? Gladwin. Let's look at condos. So with 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 houses, you can you can look at subdivisions, right? I gave you some. You can look at homes for sale, you know, with with uh, home features in it. You can look for homes for sale near places. You can you can definitely do the lakes that are around you. Um, you, you just really got to start to look at your market from the perspective of you know how would somebody that's very specifically looking for something in my market attempt to go out there and find it. Condos is another one where. Let me see what I use as my example here, Pinebrook. Okay, condos is another one where people will will search for information. So Pinebrook condominiums, Overland Park. Okay, 13 people of which 69% were brand new visitors. So what, eight or nine of those people were a, were a brand new visitor to the site in the last 30 days. We get over here and we look at the search, Pinebrook Condominiums, Overland Park, it could be Pinebrook Condos, right? We see, and they actually, the people that were searching that were spelling it wrong, right? There's actually an E on here, but Google's smart enough to show us, right? It's including both results. So again, they're in this second position right here, okay? They've also got a, a post of an open house um, in, their, in the third position, so they're really kind of taking over you know, the top portion of this result. Okay, so look at, let's look at this one. And a couple of things that, that we want to really pay attention to is she doesn't get that exact keyword phrase into this first area. Now, she almost gets it in there, condo bargain in Overland Park, Kansas, Pinebrook condos, right? She just misses it a little bit because from our earlier slide, we know we want to get that exact match keyword phrase into the, the first sentence of our of our content. Now, from a from a from the body of this post, she does a really good job. Okay, there's a lot of good content on this page as it relates to to the Pinebrook condos. And from a semantic look at this page, like you know, what else is on here that kind of relates to to each other? It's it's written in sentences. There's paragraph structure. You know, you would expect to see words like multi-level clubhouse, uh, one-level condos, right? Walking trails rec facility, right? All these words that you're just naturally going to get on the page if you're actually an expert in this area and, and decide to write about it. Right? This post and this post are, are close to timeless. Okay, and what I mean by that is if somebody lands on this post today, even though it was written two years ago, they're still going to get the information that they were probably seeking, which is what is it like to, to live on a waterfront home or, or how can I actually find the, the more homes for sale? And she's got the link in there and we'll really hammer on that in next week's class. So we'll, I'll look at her stats real quick and we see her, where's the Pinebrook one? Here's Pinebrook Condos. So again, this one's 24 months old. It has 1,800 clicks on it. And you know that's averaging, what, 85 clicks a month. We see one up here, the Talisman condos for sale, right? 1,300 clicks. Now, if she had gone out and done every condo complex in her marketplace, right, the cumulative of this sort of traffic would be really substantial. As I was looking at this, I was like, wait a minute, why do these ones, why, you know, she, she got, she had the idea, how come this only has two clicks? Like, what is that? And I started looking at it and, oh man, this one's in draft mode still. She didn't get a chance to finish this one. Right? She realized, though, at some point anyway, that had she gone through and done the subdivisions and the condo complexes and all of the kind of stuff at that real geographic specific level, that the cumulative of that would have been very substantial. And we see in the ones that she did do, the Talisman condos, the Pinebrook condos, that they're, you know, they get traffic. I pulled this one up, and I don't normally use, share this one or show this one, but I pulled this up because this is kind of more subject matter based, right? FHA approved, and and as we look down through here, 
F I mean FHA approved condos. That is a pretty specific subject based search. So because we get down in here, right? Like if I was in Branford, Connecticut, I would definitely have wanted these two people that were searching for FHA approved condos in Branford, Connecticut to have found me, right? Here's how we can write about stuff kind of at a, at a higher geographic level, right? As a whole city and get real specific with our subject matter. And I showed you guys a bunch of examples of kind of as it relates to homes for sale, but there are st so many stinking things to be writing about in the real estate space that people are out there looking for like, I mean, this again, it's just the last 30 days, but, you know, 400 people use this exact phrase. And they, and they may have used, like, other variations of this phrase that we're not seeing in these search results. But, like, I want to be the person that, you know, that is showing up for FHA-approved condos in Bergen County, New Jersey, right? And, again, there's going to be, just like we saw here, right, all these kind of other ways that somebody can use the, the, the keywords that we're using in our phrase to find our content if we realize that we want to be writing about these more specific things and whether that be more specific based on subject matter or more specific based on geography is going to kind of depend on what it is you're writing about. But I mean there's just, you know, FHA approved condos in San Diego. Like I want, the, even though, it's, even though it's, a, it's a small number of folks, right, over time it, it, it's a lot more in the different varieties and ways that they can search for it. It becomes more, and we start to get these posts that get us people that are very close to actually doing something, right? That's not just a guy that wants to look for a condo in San Diego, right? He knows he needs FHA-approved condos in San Diego, and if, if after doing that search, you can prove to him that you're the expert in that, right? Your, your business is going to be in a better position. Okay, so let's go back to our little slideshow here. Let's go back live. I see some questions in there coming over from you guys. We'll, we'll get a chance to look at those here in a minute. Let's talk about some commonly missed opportunities for search engine optimization. So we've got kind of our basic fundamentals, right? We're going to pick a keyword phrase. We're going to use that keyword phrase at the start and the end of our post. We're going to make sure that keyword phrase gets in there three to five times. We're going to make sure that we're using that exact keyword phrase as we do it. We're going to make sure that our content is valuable, right? That when somebody lands there, we've put the time into writing this thing. We know how to get it to rank, but my goodness, a real person is actually going to land on it. And when they do, we want to be able to prove to them that we're an expert, right? Because that was our one chance to make that searcher who's looking for something very specific connect with us and our business. Okay, so those are kind of the fundamentals. Let's talk about some commonly missed opportunities or some extra things that we might be able to get in and around our, our content and our post to make them a little bit more effective. And one of them is photo metadata. What? It's just when you, when you add a photo, right, and this is what the little box looks like on Active Rain, you have a chance to give it an image description and a title. The image description will be what the search engines identify that as being a picture of. The title will be what pops up when somebody hovers their mouse over it, but that also becomes a part of the keywords that are in the body of the content. So the image description is what the search engines understand that to be a picture of. The title is a part of the body of the content, which means sometimes it's not always easy to get the exact phrase we used in our, in our title into the body of the post where it reads right. So the first sentence and the last sentence are two pretty easy places we can get it in there. And we can usually sneak it in one more time, but those, that fourth and fifth time can be a little bit challenging because it doesn't always read correct. So what we can do is if we have an image in there, in the title line of our image, we can add in our keyword phrase. Okay? But if we had five images, we wouldn't want to add that exact match in there five times to each image because we would have used it once in the beginning of our, and once at the end, so that now we have it in there seven times. That's going to be a little bit too many. Right, so, we, so if we had five images, we might use some different things in our titles once we got our, our exact match keyword phrase on the page five times. Right, some semantic phrases, similar but different. <clears throat> the image description, make sure you're getting a good image description of what the picture is actually of. With the title line, you can say, you know, you can try to match your keyword phrase even if that's not exactly what the picture was of, but in the image description, make sure it is what the picture is of. Having photos on your page that relate to your content based on the image description and the title is going to enhance the profile of that piece of content, okay? 
So you always want to be using images, and that's from the perspective of when somebody lands there, people like to see images. It draws them into your content, but from the description and the title fields, you want to make sure that you're giving the search engine the right data to kind of understand that this picture actually enhances this piece of content because it's about this same thing. An anchor text link using your keyword phrase. So let's go back to loft condos in Belltown, Seattle. That's the example I was using earlier, right? Somewhere in the body of your content, and in next week's class, we'll really dive into like where it's going to be above the fold, and we'll dive into where it's going to link to. And but you need to have, or you want to have, a link that uses anchor text. And anchor text is just the words that create the link, right? You want to have a link that uses the anchor text of your keyword phrase. Okay, we'll we'll talk about this a little bit more in the links class next week. And then if possible, we want to try to get some additional media rich content and have a nice pro professional layout. And and these have <coughs> less to do with like when the search engine is indexing it and deciding if they want to rank it. It has less to do with a the signal there then once they've ranked it and somebody is accessing the content, there's still signals being sent to the search engine at that point. And the signal is, was this a good piece of content? Right? When the, when the searcher clicks it and lands on it, how long they stay there will tell the search engine if it was a good piece of content or not. Right? If they land there and immediately they go back, the search engine is going to, to take that piece of information and determine, well, maybe this wasn't the best the best match for the keyword phrase that person was was searching. But if we have some additional things on the page that might pull them in, that can get them to stay there a little bit longer. So video would be the most obvious one, right? Embedding videos if you're doing virtual tours or or you've got like a neighborhood profile video that you went out and did, right? Getting your YouTube videos, those things into the body of your content is going to be important. Custom Google Maps can be nice. Carrie right now in the chat area is going to send you guys a link for how you can create custom Google Maps. It's a really easy video tutorial that uh, Craig Daniels did on Active Rain. Really simple. Shows you how you can create these kind of additional things to get into your content to really draw people in. The professional looking we talked about last week, and that was kind of the focus of last week's class. How do we get a piece of content to look presentable? What are some of the things, good white space, we use paragraphs, right? But these are, these are factors that will, that will pull people in to your content, get them staying there longer, and send that signal back to the search engine saying, hey, this is good stuff. Keep serving this up to the next guy that searches this query. All right, so now what? Well, you're going to get a blog, and if you're... These same concepts will apply even if you're not going to blog on Active Rain. Are you going to WordPress or a blogger? Or you've got a blog on your own website. If you are going to blog on Active Rain and you want these things to actually work, you have to be a rainmaker. So if you're not a rainmaker on basically what a rainmaker is, it allows the content you write on Active Rain to be made public. So Carrie right now in your little chat area is going to give you guys a promo. If you're not currently a rainmaker and you'd like to try it out, it's two months for like a dollar each month and then it goes to the normal price of $49 a month. In two months, if you're not using this, cancel, okay? And it will have cost you $2 to at least take a shot at it. In two months, if you're using this and it's completely failing for you, then we're here to help you. Like, I'm here to help you. I've sat down with hundreds of Active Rain members over the phone and really taken them through their blog and said, hey, th you're, you're missing things here. You're not focusing on your subdivisions. You're not going after phrases that consumers are going to be looking for. Okay, so again, if you want to try that out, the, the AR promo code, it's, you go to arpromo.com forward slash, I forget, SEO something. Carrie, Carrie just sent it out to you guys. Okay, but then what would you do? Well, you're going to create a list of 10 long tail keyword phrases. Just start thinking in terms of how would people search in my market? How can I get more specific with my subject matter or more specific with my geography? And what are some of the the pieces of content that I could create. Now you could do like the lady that I showed you a minute ago did, go in and make some draft posts out of those things. Here's some of the things that I want to write about. Now hopefully you don't end up never going back to those draft posts, but get a list of 10 long tail keyword phrases, right? And then just write one piece of content using what we learned today. And there's a bunch of folks on this call that have written tons of content already. Some of you guys are doing this. I see some names on here, some people that are doing this very effectively. 
write one piece of content because you just listen to me for an hour. What time is it? You just listen to me, well, 48 minutes, so we still have some, some good time for questions. And you just listen to me for 48 minutes. If you don't take advantage of this stuff, like in probably the next week, you're going to have forgotten it and you will have wasted the last 48 minutes with me. So, one, that's all I'm asking. And action items. I've been calling them homework. And if you're with us last week, it was homework, homework, homework. This week it's action items. And the action items are going to be in the boot camp group. And maybe Carrie can send the, the link for the group out to everybody as well. Join that group. We'll have the action items. And, and Carrie may actually post the action items for you there too if you want to skip the group phase. But get those action items because in the action items, and we're, I'm kind of pushing you guys to do this, right? Write one piece of content. This fourth one is kind of the setup for next week's class. Learn if your website is equipped to generate leads because when we're talking about driving traffic online, we're talking about you know, being able to write a piece of content that ranks in the search engines, our ultimate goal at the end of the day is what? Either to get somebody to pick the phone up and call us or to get them to become a lead somehow, right? And for most of us in the real estate space, especially if we're agents, the leads that we are able to generate <coughs> are going to be based around our listings and our website's ability to display listings and generate leads. And so in next week's class, our link class, we will talk very heavily about how can we take a piece of content now that's ranking and how can we get that piece of content to generate additional traffic to our website, maybe even make our website rank a little bit better, but definitely at the end of the day, be able to generate